guys, so this is um, sanctification lesson one, and it's the history of sanctification. Now, the reason I was convicted to do this is that there's been so many changes and so many opinions about what sanctification means, and it has some to do with what's in the Bible and a lot that doesn't. <laughs> it's not even in the, like, it's not actually the definition of sanctification. So um, I think we need to, like, see where our roots come from because sometimes that can hinder us from understanding the truth. So um, let's get on it because it's kind of a lot of information. So in a few of the inloads that I've had, like where, you know, I hear things, um, the Lord has specifically said that even those that are faithful, that are left behind for the war, the reason they're left behind is because they're not sanctified. So the Lord has pressed me to do this particular lesson and then a few others after um, so that we can be very clear on what sanctification is and is not. And um, over the centuries, the views on sanctification have been widely varied, and this has filtered down into all the churches, okay? Um, also, many of the big theological words, they're big buzzwords, but they're not very well defined as, you know, how the language just changes over time. And we're in a time period where language is very um, poorly defined. So um, I am going to dig into the, the roots of everything. But at first, just so you have kind of a, a beginning point, justification, that big fancy word, is seen by God as sinless through Christ as saved. Okay, it's like a legal justification. It means you're saved legally. Okay righteousness that varies by theology depends on if you're like Methodist or Baptist or whatever um, sin is not keeping God's law that's how it's defined um, then we've got wickedness which are sins associated with team um, Satan and um, these are all very despised by God then sanctification, the definition of this varies by theology, and that's why we have to do this study. So here's a really brief history of the views of sanctification through time since the time of Christ. Um, it's a highly detailed map that I'm going to show you. And by the end of it, you, if you want a copy, you can just go into the description box and go to the link and download a copy of um, the map and the um, quotes will also be in there. So, um, but for this, for this like kind of little study right now, the entire reason we need to spend these few minutes on clarifying is so that we can really understand and introspectively look at what do we believe and does it align with our camp or does it align with the Bible? Okay, as a caveat, the information is a general understanding of each camp. There might be a Baptist church or a Methodist church or a, an Episcopal church or whatever that doesn't believe exactly what I'm putting in here. I got this off of everybody's um, basic understanding. Like if they say, hey, this is what we believe, that's where it came from. And I go through church history and that's where that came from. Okay, so this is the basics, not the like exception to the rule. Okay. Uh, but this is the, the paths on how things came to be for us. Let me also preface with, I hold no party, okay? I am like a non-denominational, um, non, I don't know. I'm just not, I don't really, I don't like the mess of the Christian mud soup that occurs right now. I think everyone should just go back to like as close to biblical Christianity as possible. But that's like so impossible with how the church has developed because everyone has all their traditions okay on to okay. the history of sanctification um after jesus death burial and resurrection estimated around 33 a.d time passed for a time marker the apostle john wrote the book of revelation in 90 a.d okay then um irenaeus in 120 a.d is the first author with credibility to write anything kind of related to sanctification so he wrote justification, so legal legal um, salvation, is at faith within the state of continual surrender to God. Um, and then he wrote that all the righteous will get a Sabbath rest during the thousand year reign. 
Um, as a note, at the bottom of each of these, I um, have an emoji-based symbolic recap. Um, so at a glance, so it's very simple to see with all this wordiness, but I just try to make it like really simple with pictures and with um, emojis so that it's just easier if you're a visual person, it can just trigger faster. Um, so there's going to be at the end of this video and then also in the download a key to what all these symbols mean, but you could pick it up pretty easily from the words match up the pictures. Um, next we have Clement of Rome, 175 AD. He's the first recorded heretic related to sanctification. And I want to note that this is having a revival in the liberal circles right now. Okay. So he wrote that righteousness is a type of universal sharing within the Ten Commandments as laws to govern boundaries. And the, that particular definition to him was sanctity. Okay. Um, similar to the sun God, the sun that God shares with all of us on earth. So basically, if you see the sun, you're sanctified. Well, that's just not even kind of close. So then in 325, the church in Rome continues on down a heretical path, integrating paganism ever so slowly. So in 325, they created Easter parallel with the goddess of Ishtar and Venus. Then in 336, they moved Christmas to December 25th, which is actually the birthday of the god Zeus or Baal. Then in 337, they approved idols and images in worship, very pagan. Then in 379, they made it official to pray to Mary, arguably Ishtar and Venus. Okay, that's who their Mary symbology is. In reaction to these distortions from Jesus' teachings, around 400 AD, Augustine makes some very bold stances. You will see a little bit of catechism still left in his views, but he wisely knows that the Roman church is way off base. So he says, justification and sanctification are by divine grace. Grace lifts the human soul to a higher order of being. Grace is available due to the merits of Christ and is imputed by baptism and communion. Okay, sanctification is holiness, making the soul secure and clean from sin. A permanent, a permanent righteousness is present. This allows for further development and perfection of the soul. For removing guilt after baptism, he says you're supposed to do venial, for venial sins, communion, and for mortal sins, penance. God does his part, but human collaboration is needed in order to achieve sanctification. And then he says the process of making a man just before God is called justification and included all of the processes of sanctification. So basically, you're not justified until you do everything that makes you sanctified. That's his basic view. Okay, so in 430, the Roman church declares Mary is the mother of God. From around 476 to 1000 AD, the world slips into the Dark Ages, which allows for the East-West Schism in 1054. Essentially, the church in Rome decides they should be the bossy parent of all the churches, and the churches from Turkey and eastward tell them to go fly a kite. And then they are known now as what is called the Orthodox churches. And then the Westerly churches, so from Italy, and West, those churches all went under the Catholic Pope as like their ruler, okay? So, the Eastern or Orthodox churches, they chose to say, and this is some of the reasons they broke up. Okay, so they had their roots in Greek philosophy. They thought that leavened bread was okay, and they thought it was fine for the um, the pastors or priests to be married, Okay. Now, everyone else who's under um, the Pope, they roots were in the Roman law, not the Greek philosophy. And then they believed the Pope was the leader of the Western Church. Um, they believed in having unleavened bread. They believed in clerical celibacy. And they believed in the confirmation of bishops. Okay, so time passes and the Roman Church, the bossy self-proclaimed parent, 
And then after the crusade of telling, going to communities, telling people they need to convert to catechism or die and literally killing them, um, then they declare an official Catholic doctrine. There are three parts of sanctification. There's Catholic baptism, which is holy by infused agape love. There's sanctification, a lifelong process. A man has possession of grace and likeness of God by corresponding to the end of one's life with divine inspiration. And the third one is irrevocable sanctification and union with God when in heaven. Followed by the doctrine of sprinkling in 1311 and the institution of dogma of purgatory and the seven sacraments in 1439. Now, these changes, as well as societal changes in the building of kingdoms and the countries we know today in Europe, stimulated a freedom to have some theological reactions. So now we're entering the 1500s, okay? Because if you remember, there's feudal rule and you have to like do whatever it is your little guy who owns your land says and worship how he says. And then each of the countries kind of broke off and they were like, I don't think we're going to be Catholic anymore. That's what's coming up. So the first notable reaction was Martin Luther in 1517. He was a professor of moral theology, and he nailed a thesis of 95 disagreements with the Roman church on the door of the church in Germany. This officially started the Protestant Reformation. In short, he wanted the Bible to be the primary text of the church, and he held a belief that it was by faith alone that a person was saved, and a single repentance did the trick of salvation. He rejected the Catholic doctrine of works, purgatory, mass for the dead, and he said the Pope had no power to take away guilt, etc., etc. Okay, there was like a lot, 95, I'm not going to read them all. Then, by 1533, John Calvin, a lawyer, was um, in which he did study Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, became very interested in studying the original documents of the Bible, and he read Augustine's works. Then he took a stance in France that stated that people are saved by grace and not by works. In England, in 1534, the Anglican Church is formed and a Jesuit order is formed in the Catholic belief. And if you know anything about the Jesuits, they're basically warlocks. Okay, now let's look at this for a second. The heresy of the Catholic Church just grows deeper and deeper. But the Protestant Reformation is exploding now in three countries. But notice that all these churches still come off of these Catholic traditions. And this is going to linger um, because that's kind of their mothership. They don't know much different. Okay. But the move toward Protestantism is clearly a move of God to have such a dynamic change in the same decade with three separate countries, three separate guys. Right. Okay. So back to... 1534, Luther creates an official doctrine that shapes what becomes the Lutheran Church. And here's the summary of his statement on sanctification. Justification by faith apart from works at baptism means that God sees you as having no sin. Justification and sanctification is the cause and effect and they are inseparable. You can't have justification without sanctification. Then he says, um, sanctification is by faith. So the Holy Spirit indwells a man. The Holy Spirit is the dynamic substance and motivation for sanctification and gifts in sanctification. A man must perform good works as a token of his new nature. Sanctification purifies the believer through the word of God. Sanctification frees the believer to do good works. Sanctification is a daily process and causes conflict with the flesh nature. Sanctification does not occur apart from the church. And the place where the word and the sacraments are present is the church. That's why sanctification could not be apart from the church. Because at that time, there is no way to have communion. Okay, meanwhile, the Catholic heresy grows as they declare that church traditions are now at an equal level to the Bible and justification is by works. Then in 1549, John Knox in Scotland springboards off of Calvin's basic views. 
By 1559, Calvin has written the Institutes, which shapes much of the Reformed belief within his view of sanctification. So he believes the believer is sanctified by God at a single moment in time. God's sanctifying work is demonstrated by the act of obedience. Without active obedience, the person isn't saved. The act of responding to the gospel and having faith in this truth requires repentance, which is an entire collection of things that he also calls regeneration, which amounts to his view of sanctification. Regeneration, a true turning of one's life because they fear God, this includes the mortification of the flesh or the old man, restraining human nature and impulses and reacting with appropriate biblical characteristics. The second one is the vivification of the spirit, which is the desire to live in a holy, devoted manner, including quiet time to reflect. And then the carrying of one's cross, which is afflictions and tests, which leads to trust. Um, this regeneration is done by the Holy Spirit to progressive sanctification by which the which purifies the believer. And this result is in the believer taking on the image of God. And lastly, the sanctification and justification are two parts of the same concept and they cannot exist in isolation. Okay, so soon after 1580 in England, Richard Hooker of the Anglican belief establishes an official view on sanctification. Righteousness is by justification and imputed by God. Righteousness is from sanctification and sanctification is comprised of doing good works which is an inevitable result of being justified. Then we move on to the 1600s. In 1638, the Baptist Church is established in the United States, branching out of England, where there was a general Baptist free will version and a particular Baptist, which was a no free will version movement. Both sprung out of the separatist or Puritans that came to America initially for religious freedom. The original Baptists in America were strongly Calvinistic or particular Baptists. In 1645, the Westminster Confession of Faith was crafted and agreed upon. And here's a summary of what it meant of the first version. I, I understand they've done several more. This was done by learned, godly, judicious, divine men. They were called upon to advise the Church of England on worship, doctrine, government for the Church of England, used by the Congregationalists and the Baptists in England first. This was to form a covenant between the Church of England, which is branching off, that is our version of Episcopal, and the Scotland or Presbyterian to unify theology. Now, this was nullified in England in 1660, but for a little tiny bit, they were all trying to be together. So, they agreed upon scholastic Calvin, Calvinism, the Trinity, the Word of God is inspired by God and infallible, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is true, sola scriptura and sola fide, which means scripture alone and justification by faith alone, the Puritan doctrine, which was a subset of this, um, assurance of salvation is not a necessary consequence of faith. They also believed in minimalist worship and they were pure Sabbatarianisms. Basically, their entire Sunday, they could do nothing. No recreation, only focus on God. Now, they all agreed upon that the Pope is the Antichrist. That Pope at that time. That's funny, right? Anyway, the Pope is the Antichrist. The Catholic Mass is a free form of idolatry. Um, they forbid marriage with non-Christians. They were predestined of elect chosen before birth. Others pre-chosen for hell. No new revelations or human traditions can be added to this doctrine that they just created. That's called cessationism covenant theology um, salvation is to the elect who are called by God justification by faith by justification by faith alone and includes being infused with Christ's righteousness to the elect and can never be lost and will be sanctified as sin is eliminated and lust is suppressed faith includes repentance 
confessing sins, and doing good works. The church is made up of all of the elect in the entire world, and they are called the body of Christ or the bride of Christ. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are only given to worthy receivers. Baptism signifies a person's union with Christ, forgiveness of sin, and newness of life. Use Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in process, and by immersion and infant baptism, um, this was approved. Now, the Lord's Supper was a commemoration of Christ's one-time sacrifice for the remission of sins and an offering of praise to God. They rejected purgatory, and on the last day, those alive will not die, but be changed, and the dead will be resurrected in the same bodies that they had when alive, um, and then brought into the same glorification as Christ. So those are all the things basically that they agree on. Now, I know that's a lot, but a lot of these things shape the churches we're in now. Okay. Um, now, in 1669, Jeremy Taylor, inspired by Hooker, um, creates a new definition for sanctification within the Anglican Church. Sanctification is inseparable from justification. Sanctification is in Christ's work alone. So then into the 1700s, and um, 1740, the Lutheran Church in the USA is established. In 1742, John Wesley, an Anglican, creates a very detailed understanding of sanctification. This is what he says, basically. Just like Reformed, but... And Reformed is that entire Westminster Confession of Faith, okay? So he's like, I agree with that, but these are the things I don't agree with. This is where I'm going to like clarify more. Um, he introduces a new doctrine of previent grace. All men have received the Holy Spirit. All people have the ability to respond to God. He has a new ideal of Christian perfection. Um, one cannot attain a sinless life. In an ever-deepening process of moral change, true godliness is a motivating spirit of love to God and man. It is received at, at a moment in time, by faith alone, expected at any moment before death. A Christian perfection is attained after progress has occurred and then a crisis point that triggers perfection. That causes all love and sinlessness that causes more progress. He believed that the righteousness is in Christ, and this assures the believer of justification. Sanctification is a process to make a person worthy of salvation, a work of God and man. Good works equal the condition of man's final justification. The second crisis is before justification. The entire sanctification cannot be complete until you have a second crisis in your life. Man must chase after sanctification, and sin is wholly voluntary. Thus, man can live sinless if he chooses. So in 1784, the Methodist Church is formed in the USA under the Ashbury title, holding to Wesley's views. In 1785, um, the Episcopal Church is established in the USA and in, off to the 1800s. In 1803, the U.S. Stone Campbell movement occurred. And here's their summary. They were two Presbyterian pastors. They rejected Calvinism. They believed in free will. Preacher, they preached revivals so large that it's called America's Pentecost to get back to the Bible alone and drop church traditions, denominations, and get back to New Testament Christianity using the apostles as the model. This started the non-denominational churches. They emphasized freedom in Christ and they traveled and did tent revivals. They had a simple creed. We speak where the Bible speaks. We are silent where the Bible is silent. In, es in essentials, unity in opinions, liberty, in all things, love. We are not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. So here's their view on sanctification. Sanctification occurs after one has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and is baptized. Sanctification is in three tenses. We have been saved. That's a legal justification and a holy state. 
so justified. We are being saved, which is sanctification. This is holy character and progressive sanctification. And we will be saved, which is glorification, a holy creation and eternal. Okay, so then by 1837, revivals were in full swing. And off of the Wesleyan views, Phoebe Palmer and others created the Wesley Holiness View. They believe just like Wesley, but here's where they diverge from Wesley. They believe you're saved at belief in Christ, but belief means that you had to have a crisis point after you already understood Christ. Um, the Holy Spirit regenerates the believer's inward character. The inward character cannot change until one fully understands the gift of of God's gift of grace. Genuine faith produces outward holiness and improved moral character. Christian perfection is attainable by God's grace being infused into the souls by the Holy Spirit. A restricted lifestyle helps increase virtue. Death to self helps this process. Sanctification does not occur until a single crisis point where a wholehearted commitment is finally made to the Lord and entire sanctification happens and this is called Christian perfection. Okay, so then in 1866, the Stone Campbell movement birthed an official title, that of the Christian churches and the churches of Christ, differing at that time mainly in that the churches of Christ preferred a more primitive style of worship with only non-instrumental music, and they kept a particular routine in how they did their their weekly services. In 1869, in England, Charles Spurgeon made a stand against the Anglican Church. He had been attending Baptist Church, and he took Calvin's views, um, and then he modified that to make his views. So here's the summary of Charles Spurgeon's changes to Calvin's basic views. He believed in a threefold sanctification. Um, he believed you're sanctified by the Father, Jude 1 is his proof on that, sanctified in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1, and sanctified through the Spirit, 1 Peter 1. Uh, justification by grace through faith. God gives you grace to believe, elect, and he elects men. God gives you grace to live holy. God provides the Holy Spirit to indwell and regenerate the Christian in sanctification. Justification is through Christ once for all. And then in 1870, the Catholic Church decides the Pope is infallible. Obviously, we're just staying on the heresy line. Then in 1874, branching off of the Wesley Holiness view in England, sprung up the Keswick view, um, named after the city where they first presented these beliefs in England. So this mirrors the Wesley Holiness with three changes. Man believes in Christ. Man needs to abandon self perfectly until the fruit of the spirit is achieved. Then victory over sin can be achieved. And this is called practical perfectionism. Holiness is conformity to God's character. Victory over sin can only happen when a crisis or a painful event that causes a break away from the, from the carnal world, morbid introspection for hidden sins, and then a reconsecration of one's life in that process. Then victory results in a spirit-filled life Note that the Holy Spirit that they describe in their meetings is akin to demonic possession in that it takes over a person and allows infestations that are uncontrolled, but they're calling this the power of God. Um, and then you had to show evidence of victory, and this is when this comes into being. So evidence of victory was speaking in tongues. The Christian service is an outcome of a spirit-filled life. The believer is never free from sin. In the 1900s, we've got 1908, the Catholics decide that their members must be christened into the church. In 1910, 
Um, Christians concerned with humanism, evolution, Freudian views in society, and the liberal sway um, that many church denominations were taking due to those influences, um, they a bunch of different people got together and they um, made the original fundamentalist movement, which um, we're going to go down through their beliefs. Okay, so the fundamentalists, 1910, a movement to move back to the Bible initially by conservative Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodist churches as a reaction from the Holiness and Keswick revival meetings and humanism that was infiltrating the culture in the churches. Their views of those different camps, the sanctification understanding was very diverse. So I'm not going to put their view of sanctification because they don't have a single view, but this is a very um, important element to what's coming. So these guys, the fundamentalists agreed on five fundam fundamentals. One, the Bible is historically accurate. Two, the Bible is literal. Three, God created the world. Four, the Bible is without error. And five, they called themselves Protestants. Okay. Then we've got in the 1960s. So we have a big span of time. The fundamentalists are all the same, you know, basic people. Then in the 1960s, there was a reemergence of fundamentalists standing against cultural change again. So many denominations united to fight against these things, the banning of school prayer, a woman's right to choose abortion, evolution in textbooks. They all decided the Catholic Church was a cult. They took a separatist stand in the 60s. They separated from the culture. They felt engaging in the secular culture was justifying their behavior. So then we skip off to the 1970s and 80s. Much of the fundamentalist movement became political, thinking that without changing the laws or the morality, the U.S. would be such an intolerable wrong affecting all, but they did not achieve their end result. This is what happened. The moral majority was formed. Um, Make America Christian Again campaign. The focus on the family was started. Homeschooling and Christian schools increased. The King James was put on the shelf and the NIV, the NAS, or the ESV versions were elevated. The charismatic leadership took over in the power structure of the leadership. Um, a sect of Catholic churches joins in. For real? Okay. So in the 1900s and following, Still heavily influenced in politics, they merged with evangelicals for political purposes. They put There was a big, huge push to return to the King James Version, and the public perception of them became a narrow-minded, legalistic, patriarchal, authoritarian group. So in 1911, the Pentecostal movement was started. It's similar to the Keswick's, but it has salvation in three steps. Salvation upon exposure and belief in Jesus, the second blessing and sanctification where that crisis is needed, the crisis is needed for number three, and then number three is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence, a, Pente a Pentecostal experience, the reception of the charismata, um, being given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which means speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, healing, message of wisdom, messages of knowledge, faith, miraculous powers. Okay, now we go to 1919. Louis Schaefer, an evangelist that crossed paths with some of the Keswick viewed people, was a good debate friend with um, S.I. Schofield and came up with a new view on sanctification that he also later founded Dallas Theological Seminary. That's what the DTS is down there, um, of which many pastors that you here have attended. Schaefer agrees with the Reformed view, so Calvinism, but he did many revival meetings with the victorious life Keswickian preachers, which triggered him to make some strong differences with the Reformed. So first, the human responses should not be alongside of belief for any terms of salvation because this undermines God's grace. So no experience had to happen 
and no confession, no baptism, no expectation of immediate behavioral change was expected. Um, the carnal Christian can become spiritual through a real adjustment of the spirit. No divisions between justification and sanctification, but there are three distinct aspects of it. There's positional sanctification, which is justification at faith. There's experimental sanctification, which is a moment-by-moment -moment victory. And there's ultimate sanctification, which happens after death. Sanctification that happens by human initiative and meeting with yieldedness. Surrender, which means surrender allows the Holy Spirit to work. It's an impartation of life. The nature of God, not a transformation, but creating something wholly new. And the carnal creation has a conflict with the transformed soul. In 1945, Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran theologian, deeply affected by World War II, which changed his view on sanctification. So, initially, justification was the means by which we attain the saving act of God in the past, primarily about the status of a man and the law of God and the new creation of man. Sanctification meant the promise of God's activity in the present and the future, primarily about the relation when the Christian's separation from the world until the second of the coming of Christ. So basically when you die. Um, and man's preservation until the day of Jesus Christ. But then he had the crisis of the war, right? World War II, it's a big deal. So um, pre-war, he felt like moral purity and being pious and a moral saint. This was expressive of his faith and sanctification. But post-war, after literally being in the war and seeing so much and having to do things that he didn't feel were holy... Um, Post-war, he felt that daily faith and prayer through pain and physical suffering and psychological suffering and difficulties was more proof of faith and bonds a person more closely to the Most High. Then we go to 1946. The National Association of Evangelicals was established with the influence of of Presbyterians, Baptists, Wesley Holiness, and Methodists to be a middle way. Similar to Keswick and Schaefer, but this is what they agreed upon. Um, justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace. Jesus is the substitution for our sins and makes a way for us to be justified. Justifying grace is not separate from God's sanctifying power and purpose. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ and convicts the world of all sin and guilt, um, regenerates sinners, baptizes them into union with Christ, making them heirs in the family of God, illuminates and guides and equips and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. Christ-like living is commanded by God, including loving God supremely and others sacrificially, living out one's faith with care for one another, compassion towards the poor, justice for the oppressed, God's word, the spirit's power, fervent prayer in Christ's name to combat the spiritual forces of evil, and obeying Christ's commission to make disciples of all people in word and deed, sharing the gospel. They also agreed on ordinances of baptism and communion are celebrated by those with genuine faith to confirm and nourish the believer but neither are the means of salvation. Okay, then we move to 1954, the Augustinian dispensationalism view, which was brought forth by John Valverd, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary after Schaefer. So this is similar to the Keswick and Schaefer, but then he has some different alterations. So a believer has a born again date and a believer has a dedication date. The progressive sanctification has three distinctions. The first is justified, then yield to sanctification. Justified means going to heaven and saved. Sanctified means there's levels of holiness. Saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of Christ. Then, second, though all Christians are indwelled with the Spirit permanently, 
baptized by the Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit, and sealed by the Spirit, not all Christians are filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit is an active work distinct from salvation. Conviction by the Spirit is evidence. Um, the Spirit is the cornerstone and main focus for a Christian to attain sanctification. The work of God repeatedly in the life of the believer is the source of sanctification and spiritual fruitfulness. The person must yield because unhindered work by the Holy Spirit infuses spiritual power to do more than one could do alone. Sanctification means yieldedness um, by submission to the Holy Spirit. Indwelling of the Spirit is a permanent situation, but baptism of the Holy Spirit is an event that causes the sealed status and union with Christ at the moment of faith and filling of the Spirit. It is a recurring event that is experiential. The third distinction, um, attaining the final sanctification at death, so glorification. So now... Over the past 70 years, many, many things have changed within the church. Um, many strands have morphed into evangelical-like um, versions of their parent origins. Um, some have gone very social or political or biblically liberal. Some have morphed into some form of neo-paganism. Um, some have satellite churches and are basically a TV church. Some are seeker-friendly. Um, others are called emerging churches, and they're basically heresy. Um, some others may employ new thought, also heresy. Others may merge all religions under one cap and try to homogenize the gospel. Changing, um, changing the man is the goal, not spreading the gospel. Now, I know that this is a lot of information, and I had to spit it out really fast because there's so much to cover. Um, but I really think that if you can like take a second and like really filter through these, like maybe like look at the documents, you could really think through what this is saying. You can see that this is a mess. This is a mud soup. There is like some truths in all of them, but none of them seem to have smacked it on the nail on the head. So um, anyway, let's, I'm just like this, biblically grounded kind of person. I don't care what your opinion is. I only care God's opinion is. So that's what we're going to do in lesson two, three, and four. We're just going to go God's opinion. Okay. But you have to understand where this all starts. Otherwise, I don't think that you can understand the truth as well, because you'll be shadowed by, no, but my pastor said whatever. Other thing is this, we are, um, needing to understand sanctification and righteousness because it is essential for what is coming at us okay so i don't want anyone to miss the boat i want you guys to be fully educated and not um have any distortions or distractions from the history of the church which is excellent it's brought us to this point we have found the lord with it but it's not perfect so um Let's see if we can, our generation at this end here can do a little better. <laughs> How about that? So uh, please try to find uh, lesson two, three, and four, and I'll see you next time.